Hello and welcome and thank you all for, for, for coming. Um, great venue, I love the, you know, the ambience. Feel free to eat and drink, it will make us actually feel better. Um, we know that your time won't be wasted, even if you didn't like the talk, but you will. <laughs> okay, so uh, we're going to talk about developer productivity. It has like a strange name, obviously suggested by ChatGPT. It's not that we write our own abstracts anymore. Um, and it is like a dual perspective on best practices and testing. And then you go like, what the fuck dual perspective of developer productivity? Maybe it's coffee machine and noise canceling headphones which kind of, you know, dual perspective on developer productivity. Both of them are important, but uh, today we're going to talk about the engineering aspect of developer productivity. My name is Baruch Sadogurski. I'm at Jay Baruch on whatever social media is trending or called this week. Um, developer productivity advocate, that's what I do for uh, Gradle. Um, you, who knows the build tool? Everybody knows the build tool. Who knows that it's not only the build tool? Okay, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit today. And this is why they pay me the big bucks and for me here, but I will do my best to restrain myself uh, from doing a very blunt product pitch. It will be mild product pitch. Anyway, <laughs> um, Java developer back in when Java 8 wasn't even a thing, when Java 1.4 was a thing. Um, and then um, I worked f with JFrog for 11 years, um, and we pivoted with JFrog and with Artifactory from uh, development to DevOps. Uh, now I'm back kind of working with developers, talking about developer productivity engineering, hashtag DPE. We're going to hijack this hashtag. It now uh, belongs to some weird, um, any French speaking people here? Yeah, so uh, you will know what I'm talking about. I think it's, <laughs> it's, it has something to do with construction codes um, it's like three words in French that I try to memorize, but I don't remember. Never mind. But forget about it. Developer productivity engineering starting today. A um, couple of books that I co-author: DevOps tools for Java developers, which kind of brings both my Java and DevOps background, and the Liquid software best practices on how to release software in our Liquid day and age. Um, my partner come today, Eli Aliner, and he's a co-founder at Atomic Jar. Um, who knows test containers? Uh, same people who know Gradle. Uh, <laughs> same deal, we will talk about test containers a little bit and stuff which is not only test containers. Um, uh, very impressive resume, founding team at AWS. Uh, anyone heard about S3 maybe? <laughs> it's this guy, it's this Sorry. guy. How about Bing, the search engine? Maybe this guy. And uh, how about uh, Pivotal, uh, Cloud Foundry? Also this guy. <laughs> very, very <laughs> impressive, right? I'm, I'm really honored. Okay, the most important slide of this talk is this. If you go to speaking.jbaruch and note how I hijacked Switzerland top level domain for the purpose of this URL. Uh, thank you, Switzerland. Um, yeah, if you go there, there is a page there dedicated for this talk tonight. It already has the slides. It will have the video if I typed, tapped all the buttons correctly on my phone. Um, and it has all the links, everything that we're going to talk about and uh, already mentioned, like the books, but also everything else is, is there. So uh, in case uh, this uh, URL is hard to remember, I make it in news on you. It's in the bottom of each and every slide together with our Twitter handles, the Twitter handle for Toronto Jug, and the hashtag that we are actively trying to hijack, the DPE um, hashtag. I'm working on it, you see. Um, okay, let's talk about productivity. And conversation about productivity, I want to start with conversation about motivation. They are very closely related concepts because in the end of the day, they are related through very important things to, to us as developers. Uh, Daniel Pink, an amazing author, one of my favorites, wrote a lot of great books. One of his best is Drive. Drive is the book about the surprising truth about what motivates us. Basically about motivation. Um, I don't know about you, I was walking around sure that the motivation of humans is pretty basic thing. It works with carrots and sticks. 
um, you pay them enough money and they are motivated, you take enough money out of them and um, inflict physical pain and they are less motivated or motivated not to do that whatever they just did anymore. Um, it turns out that while it is true, it's also not true, especially for intellectual workers, which apparently some people consider developers. Um, it's, a, it's a debate, I know. But uh, let's assume for a second that it is. And then it turns out that when we kind of take money off the table, we have enough money for, for our lives, actually other things can kick in. And the three things that kick in are autonomy, mastery, purpose. Now, I want each and every one of you to think for a second how those three things, autonomy, I can work by myself, I'm not uh, micromanaged. Anyone enjoys micromanagement? Well, Ellie, you enjoy micromanagement because you inflict it. Anyone <laughs> enjoy micromanagement from being like managed? Not really. Um, so yeah, autonomy, you can do your own thing, you are not micromanaged. Mastery, you are do, you're good in what you are doing and you are getting better. And purpose, what you do actually matters. Right, so mastery, you use the best tools, you kind of enjoy how awesome you became lately with those new shortcuts in IntelliJ, right? And then purpose, you actually see your code running in production somewhere and someone actually uses it and that's pretty awesome, that's, that motivates us. So there is a lot of truth about that. And the question is, okay, thinking about it, yes, that makes sense. What it has to do with productivity? Um, I will give you a couple of examples that kind of ruin our productivity and you will see how they correlate to those motivational things. For example, the flow. Where we are in the flow, we are all very, very productive. When we are kicked out of the flow, for example, our build, yeah, a gradle, our build takes forever <laughs> and we are distracted to do other things. We have this context which we go to read emails, we do other stuff and then context which is really terrible. Because coming back is very, very hurtful. And I'm, I won't even ask you to vote. I know for sure that each and every one of you experienced that. Right? What does it do to your motivation? What does it do to your feel of autonomy and mastery in this example particularly? And you know what? Only 84%, I don't know what's going on with the other people, how other 16% feel, but 84% feel that it's a real pain. Too much time spent waiting on build and test feedback, either locally or during CI, from people who, who we asked, 84% agree. And then another source of frustration, stuff like flaky tests. I have a flaky test in my test suite. It runs last, sometimes it passes, sometimes it fails. And this is extremely annoying, especially when this test has nothing to do with my code. And you know what, maybe the flakiness, it's not even, comes from validation logic, but it's an environment which is unstable. Isn't it annoying? Of course it is. And what do we do when it happens? Just run it again and hope that it will pass? Sometimes it does, but you know, yep. 65% agree that inability to easily troubleshoot and undermine the root cause of tests, including flaky tests, I guess the other uh, what, 35% uh, don't write tests, so they don't have this problem. <laughs> uh, but yeah, um, another example, boiling the frog. I have a feeling that everything is slower somehow. Well, we feel that with our laptops and with our phones, right? After a year or two, it's like, well, pfft, how it is so slow? But we know what to do, we just upgrade. What about our build? It, pfft, we feel that it slows down. We are not sure why and it's maddening as well. It hits us into autonomy. We need to ask other people for help to see what's going on. It hits us obviously in mastery because we're not productive as, as we wanna be. And 50, more than 50%, almost 60% agree that this is a problem as well. So basically, developer productivity is very tightly related to autonomy, mastery, and purpose. When we are productive, it especially helps our mastery and it also uh, helps our autonomy. And also we're productive working on stuff that matters so it helps us purpose as well. And it highly obviously related to motivation. Autonomy, tools and people are in, in our way. Mastery, 
tools and processes help us to excel and not in our way and purpose the productive the whole product in what well, i should make a joke you cannot take product out of productive huh and and product this is our purpose right this is uh, all of us work to actually do something so obviously they are all very very closely related and um here is an idea developer productivity engineering is something that we all can do in order to make us all more productive now why i'm stating that all of us can do it because of the engineering part all of us are software engineers we know how to engineer stuff so let's engineer developer productivity how do we do that here are some ideas faster foster faster feedback one day i will be able to say it from first try foster faster feedback what does it mean you have some ideas well i want my build to be faster i want my tests to be faster to be faster i want to know more about how my what i'm doing is it good did it break something faster eliminate toil for developers this toil of hey i need to rerun the tests now because there is a flaky test or toil of i completed some task I pushed my code, I created a pull request, but now I also need to log into another system in order to move the ticket from one column to another. This is toil. Do we know how to eliminate it? Hell yes. Let's do it. Collaborate through effective tooling. Again, a very engineering challenge. How do we explain someone else that things went wrong on my build? Or that something is not as performant as it used to be. Well, I feel that my build is slow somehow. You know what? Just go away. I, I have no way to help you when you describe it this way. Show me a trend with numbers that I can dig from this trend digger, uh, uh, deeper and compare what actually changed. I can help you. Collaborating through engineering tooling is collaborating through effective tooling. Prioritize automation and eliminate bottlenecks. Again, engineers. Who, wrote, uh, who read uh, The Phoenix Project? Not enough of you. You all should. It's a book about DevOps, which all of us should know something about anyway. But um, it actually talks about a previous concept that DevOps kind of born out of. It's called the theory of constraints. Anyone heard about theory of constraints? Again, not enough. There is another book called the goal that the phoenix project is kind of a just a re rewrite of the goal that talks about theory of constraints as a novel very nice and it the main idea is that the only thing worth improving is the bottleneck because if you optimize not in the bottleneck and the bottleneck remained you didn't do anything this is true for our process working process as well we need to find the bottlenecks we need to improve them and then move forward. Embrace rigorous observability for proactive improvement. This is something that I already mentioned when I spoke about the performance slides. If we didn't observe it, we have some vague idea that everything is slower. We need to actually observe what is going on. Now, observability being the hottest thing in the industry for the last years, but for production environments. Obviously, it's been there because it's super important and this is where it kind of came to be and now it's, it's thriving. There is like a, every second company is observability, the other one is security and that covers the entire new uh, uh, landscape. Uh, but what about the observability of our work? Do we know what's going on in our working pro process? We should. We should. Outcomes over output. Obviously, the more tools we use, the more complicated our setups are. There are here and here. Yeah, come in. There, there are space. There is space. All, also over there, if you, if you want. So, yeah. The more complex our ecosystem is, the more noise it generates. And, and it does. Uh, how do we actually take what matters, outcomes, uh, you, you can watch this screen, I guess, right? Is it too small? 
or or really there there are seats here that will work better for you yep okay. here you go no here is great uh, <laughs> i'll try to speed less <laughs> no promises though oh you're in the right t-shirt you're good okay uh, right so we will try to 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 take like the the the, uh, the outcomes out of it and something that is very critical now a lot of those are done for production environments, right? I mentioned observability, hell yes. Um, uh, eliminate toil, done for production environments and for your CI CD processes. Oh, automation and bottlenecks, this is what DevOps is about, right? But it's all about the product. None of it, it's about our productivity. Why? Because of the mindset. Everybody are obsessed about the product. How fast we release it, how smooth we release it, how good is the quality? No one thinks about the productivity of engineers. We have to change it. We have to make sure that our productivity is on top of organizational mind, and it actually requires dedicated effort. And the best companies out there, your Snowflakes, your Spotify's, your Netflix's, the Uber's, Lyft's, they have dedicated teams that work, all they do, is work on developer productivity engineering. And this is how it should be. And we're all here hearing about DPE to then come back to our companies and make sure our companies have the dedicated organizational mindset. Okay, let's see what we can do tomorrow. Tomorrow is, yeah, Friday. Tomorrow we're working. So what we can do tomorrow in order to make it happen. There are small improvements that can make a huge difference. For example, use better IDE. How many of you write code in Notepad? No one, thank you. How many of you use IntelliJ? Almost all of you. The rest use VS Code? Eclipse? Okay, well, well, well it's, it's, all, it's all downhill from there. <laughs> use better IDE? It's the single most effective thing to make your writing code process more effective, right? And it's easy. There are free solutions. VS Code is free. Community um, uh, edition of uh, JetBrains is free. Um, JetBrains gives away every month two licenses for every jug to raffle away. If you come to this jug enough times, there is 100% possibility you will end up with an uh, IntelliJ license. It's easy as that. Test better. Test containers. Ellie will tell us all about it in a second. But yes, your tests, if they don't suck, they at least can be better. How they can be better? By finding the sweet, sweet combo of being production-like and blazing fast. Yeah. Are you intrigued? You should be. Ellie is next. Enforce better code. Sonar, Sonar Cube, Sonar, uh, whatever the, the other product is, the linting, Sonar Lint, whatever the other product of Sonar is. They are great tools to make your code better. This is yet another quality gate that you can bring to your process to make sure that you're working more efficiently. Um, test more reliably. Flaky test detection. How do you detect flaky, flaky tests? Well, if you have a test that fails sometimes and passes sometimes, this is a flaky test. How do you know that it does that? You run it multiple times, you observe. What do you do with that? You actually do something about it. It's not something, it's, it's sometimes not your responsibility and sometimes you have other things in mind and sometimes it's, it's harder to, to, it's easier to run it three times, see it pass and forget, but getting back to the organizational mindset we need to do something better with it. And there are tools like a um, tool from Gradle that it's called uh, the Velocity that actually takes care of that for you. But you know what? You, your own juniors, you have already in mind how to do that, how you can automatically find it, how you can automatically tag it, and how you can generate a report of flaky tests and send it to the right people who can use it. Am I right? Everybody know what to do? We're going to do job interviews. This will be your um, uh, what you need to lay out the architecture of the thing. No, seriously, you know how to do it. 
and foster faster feedback. Now, foster faster feedback, I started with it in a previous slide as one of the most important things. And I will uh, repeat how important it is and what can you do in order to make it happen. So let's talk about feedback efficiency. <coughs> feedback efficiency, it's something that you experience every day. When you type your code in the IDE and it highlights it red, this is your feedback. You know that you missed a character, you forgot a semicolon, or, or did something else. This is a sub-second feedback efficiency. Build. You want it to be very close to that, right? But we want it to be seconds. But realistically, who has build that takes seconds? <coughs> like, not hundreds of seconds. <laughs> and, okay, fine. But actually, I guess most of us under 10 minutes, around 10 minutes, something like that. Uh, more than 10 minutes, uh, we need to work on that. Yeah, okay, and then, and then again, we won't get into horror. So well, it's Halloween, maybe we should. Um, <laughs> CI, minutes, you know what? Hours, you know what, who cares? And then production, hours, days, month. Hey, I won't say who cares because we should care, but I would say it's not critical how long this feedback is because we don't really wait for it. Well, I hope we don't. Okay, I made a pull request. Next time I work is after I see this one in production and check that it works. That's not really how we do things, right? So the, the like lower we go, the more farther away it is from developer, the less we wait for feedback. So it's reverse dependency on distance from developers IDE build and then CI and production, right? Now build is an anomaly here because it's very close to developers. We run it all the time when we write code. After each like couple of statements that we wrote, we want to check that you know that that it's okay. But it's not seconds. It's actually minutes, tens of minutes, dozens of minutes. So the build is outlier here and. Uh, we all know that it's acknowledged in classics when XDHK have a, uh, have a comic about it. Now, how do you feel about it? You may be giggle for the first time, but this is actually, excuse me, bullshit. I don't buy it. No one is happy that their build is slow. No, maybe for the first time we have time like to do that. After 20 times that we run our build every day and it's still slow, we won't enjoy it anymore. So, eh, not really. It is slow and it is maddening. It's not fun. Now, there is one more pro problem. Build is a complicated domain by nature. We can kind of hide the complexity and then reduce with that the um, usefulness or the versatility or the flexibility of the build tool. And then look at you, Maven. Or we can go the other way around and we can expose the entire sheer power of a build domain on non-suspecting developer and then just bury them in the, under the complexity of the thing and then look at you, Gradle, right? So here, Bruce Eckel, the author of Thinking in Java that a lot of people, I think among us, also learned Java by the, his books. One of the smartest people in the industry, for sure. And he's like, you know what, fuck it. Gradle is too complicated for me. I need to know everything about build in order to do something, and that's not my job. I don't want to learn everything about build. So this is a real problem. It's slow, and the developers have no idea why. And this is even more maddening. Now, what do we do with that? What is build in the layman terms? Well project setup, we're downloading the internet, and then we generate artifacts by compiling, packaging, whatever, and then we test whatever we test, and then we deploy the artifacts locally, remotely, whatever, or just delete them, which is also fine if it's a local build. Now, what can go wrong? Project setup, downloading the internet, artifact generation, tests, and artifact deployment, <laughs> obviously. And when can it go wrong? At any time, basically. <laughs> so, in order to debug the build, we really need to understand all of it, which is very hard to do without the right tools that can help us. 
And this goes into the category of outcome over output, right? Build the Rosenos output. And I'm not to only talking about the logs. I'm talking about the entire concept. It's, it's output we, that we need to deal. Instead, if we can get only the outcome, only what's important, for example, when the build fails or when it's slow, what went wrong in, in the way that we understand, then we can do something about it. So the build for asteroids and developers, and here is the idea of ChatGPT of how to speed up a Maven build. First item, skip tests. <laughs> and I'm going like, what the actual fuck? The whole idea of the build is to get feedback. If I skip the test, I defeat the entire purpose. Maybe I should skip compilation as well? I mean, what can, can possibly go wrong? Tests and compilation are exactly the same thing. We wrote something and we want to check that it's correct. Syntaxly correct in terms of, of, in terms of uh, compilation and semantically correct or functionally correct in terms of tests. They are exactly the same thing. We cannot skip tests. We want faster feedback, not less feedback. So what feedback do we want? Now, when ChatGPT can do argues with that we don't need tests, let's talk about what we do want. An example of, or not an example, a complete list of the feedback that we want can be found in our CI-CD pipeline. Because CI-CD pipeline checks all of it. It checks compilation, it checks unit tests, it checks integration tests, it checks code coverage, it checks linting, static code analysis, dependency scanning, secret scanning, security static code analysis, load testing for non-functional requirements, resource utilization, and compliance. A proper CI CD pipeline have them all. Now, how about that as a feedback? Well, not great, not terrible. Obviously, it's not terrible because we check all those things because before our code gets to production, which is good. What, this is what we want. Why it is not great? It is not great because we are not waiting for the feedback before we're doing something else. There are two types of feedback, asynchronous and synchronous. Asynchronous feedback is the CI CD. We never wait for it. It just runs whenever it runs. But if something is wrong and we need to get back and fix it, the results are very distracting. We need to drop what we're doing and go fix the build because the bunny is depressed. <laughs> Ellie, you'll tell them everything about the depressed bunny. Synchronous. Synchronous feedback is our build. We wait for it in the flow, but if we are going to pile all the quality checks into our build, it will be so slow that it will piss us off, right? So now, what can we do? Yeah, so is that the difference between the line between uh, synchronous and asynchronous is obviously commit time. Uh, this is what we wait for. This is what we don't wait for. Now, what it will be lovely if we get all this feedback in our build. It would be great for how confident we are in the code that we produce, but the first thing you think is like, okay, my CI takes an hour, now my build will take an hour, I will go and shoot myself right now. Oh, you're Canada, you have nothing to shoot yourself with. But you got the idea. Um, no, not a good joke? Sorry. Uh, I tried. Um, okay, this is what we want. We want maximum feedback. And we want it super fast. This is what we really want. There are two general principles in doing that. The first is skipping what can be skipped. And again, your engineers start thinking about how you can skip stuff inside your build. I will give you a couple of ideas. You can think of more obviously. Incremental build works out of the box in any modern build tool. Better in some, less successful in others, but exists everywhere. How does it work? 
it doesn't build what the, haven't been changed. If you run your build, Maven, Gradle, Basel, whatever, twice in a row, the first one will take whatever it will take, the second will be blazing fast. It skipped everything because the inputs are there, what your source files, and the outputs, your whatever jar file that you produced is there. So there is nothing to do. Don't build what isn't affected. When you have a multi-module build, microservices or what's not, the incremental build will understand which modules depend on which ones, and it won't run the tests, and it won't build the modules that are not affected. Which is nice, it works out of the box, there is nothing to do with it, but it's not perfect. It's not perfect for two reasons. The first is, it relies on produced artifacts to do the avoidance. For example, if you run clean build, it will build everything anew again because you deleted the jar files, so it goes like, well, we don't know what to compare to, we need to build everything anew. It also requires physical artifacts to do the comparison. You cannot say that my inputs are environment variables and my outputs are um, some variables in the code or in the build. It cannot do that. So it requires physical artifacts. The other outcome, the other uh, shortcoming is that it relies on architectural decisions. When it decides what tests to run, it will look at your declared modules and how they depend on each other to decide what should we test and what's not. There are two problems with that. Sometimes we have a monolith, we don't have modules, so it will run everything all the time, or we just didn't break it well enough. The other is, well, in the ideal world, the API will never depend on the implementation. We don't live in ideal world, and sometimes stuff breaks in unexpected places. Your incremental build won't know how to change it. This is one of the reasons why we keep running clean build, because we don't, try, we don't trust the incremental build. This is why we run clean builds all the time and make Andres uh, angry, if you know what I mean. If you don't, never mind. Um, there is a friend of ours is on a holy crusade of not running clean builds. Uh, doesn't work for him very well. He's not sure why, I know why. Because we don't trust incremental builds. He just made it. Maybe it has incremental build. We trust it even less, that's true. Okay, <laughs> caching. <laughs> caching is the solution because caching don't have those two shortcomings. It makes the build faster because it actually calculates the checksums of the incomes, which can be anything, doesn't have to be physical artifacts. And then it archives the outputs and correlates it with those caches. And again, the outputs can be anything. It can be whatever virtual concept that you invent. So it does what incremental build does, but when you run clean build, it will still work. And it makes build faster for everybody. And what it means is that we can share those caches. If we have exactly the same project and I just give you my caches, your build will be blazing fast because we have the same incomes that didn't change and I just provided you with the outcomes. So it will actually work. Remote cache is an extremely powerful way to make the build faster for everybody and it works just great. And it makes the build faster always because remote caches are up to date somewhere. For example, on your CI server. Your CI server constantly build. Even if you didn't build today, even if it's morning for you and it's afternoon for your colleague um, in Europe, their caches will help you to skip this first morning long build. Yeah, you might want coffee, so you will go there anyway, but if you don't want coffee and you want to start working, it will speed it up for you, even if you didn't build anything for a while. And it makes all the parts of the build faster because it doesn't rely on known in advance physical artifacts. Incremental build works for a very small set 
of defined plugins or, or, or tasks or, or goals. Because someone thought about, okay, how do we correlate that in advance? Caching works for every task, every plugin, every goal in Maven or Gradle that you bothered to declare inputs and outputs. That's the only thing you know. That's the only thing you need. You throw a couple of annotations or a couple of uh, code or XML in your build declaration. Those are the inputs of, the, of this task. Those are the outputs of this task. Boom, next thing you know, it is cached. It is very, very easy to do and it will work for everything. So here is an example. As I mentioned, you already know how to cache stuff. I just gave you the, uh, I just gave you the algorithm, right? So you don't need any tool to do that. It also comes free out for Gradle and Maven 4 has um, uh, experimental support for caching as well. So you don't need to pay anything to actually make your builds much faster and you more productive. Now, this is a screenshot from Gradle Velocity, the product formerly known as Gradle Enterprise, that actually just visualized the savings. So this is what's here. You can see the avoiding. This is an Apache project called BIM. Um, Gradle provides a free Velocity instance for the entire Apache Foundation um, and we are lucky to pick on what they are doing. So this is BIM. Build time, 17 minutes. Avoidance savings, 47%. There is some gains by up to date, this is your incremental build. Almost two minutes, well, not great. Local build cache, nine minutes remote build cache three minutes. Those, this is where the real savings are caching. Again, out of the box, free, local, remote also free. You need to set up your own instance for the remote node itself, but other than that, it's also free. Another way to avoid unnecessary work is only run tests that needs to be run. Obvious, of course. Million dollar questions, how do I know? which test to run. We don't. How about we throw machine learning on it? How about we teach the machine what code do we change and how tests behave? And then it will tell us what changes require which tests to run. Learns code changes effect de facto, skips test with high degree of confidence. The way it works, code changes and test results are thrown into the learning model. And then after a while, the model predicts which changes fail which tests. It's a very um, successful paper that came out of, uh, uh, then it was called Facebook research, now it's I guess meta research. A lot of companies actually use this paper to implement predictive text selection. And it works incredibly. And the most incredible thing about it is how we can see the smartness of its learning and understand that it doesn't actually know why when it comes to those awesome conclusions. I will give you two examples. Oh, yeah, uh, first of all, yeah. So what changed and where it changed? That's kind of the model. Correlate with observed test failures. Next thing we know, predicts which changes will fail which test. That's the idea. Couple of examples of how the machine predicts the results without understanding why. The more tests the project has, the less they break. For all of us, this is obvious. But it's actually proven by the clueless machine that actually just run the observations and came to this conclusion. How about that? And the second even funnier. Refactoring in Java breaks us less than in JavaScript. And you go, duh. <laughs> Obviously, this one is strongly typed language. This one is loosely typed language. Obviously, the refactoring will work better. But the, 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 the machine has no idea what we just said. All it knows that from this project, it breaks more. From this project, it breaks less. And boom, it actually makes sense. This is very cool. 
So if you go to speaking.jbaruch, you obviously have a link there for the research. It actually surprisingly digestible for being a, uh, um, like a, a research paper. Um, and it's not very long and it's a great reading. I, I truly recommend, no sarcasm here. Um, this is another example, another project that um, um, enjoy uh, the velocity and we enjoy to see what they are doing is the Spring Framework. This is them. So they run simulations uh, to teach the machine and we can just observe how, how well the simulation predict the results. So 99.4% accuracy of total end goals failures predicted correctly. 99.4%. It actually missed two tests out of more than 24 thousands. How long it saves? This is a weak view, six days. A week like an entire developer on a Spring Boot team time. This is amazing savings. Almost 40% of avoidable tests. This is really cool stuff. Well, you might be worried about those two, and you should be, because maybe they are very important and we just miss them. But remember, we are talking about local builds. We do all the thing for one purpose only. We want faster feedback on our local builds. What we don't care about? Async feedback. So what we're gonna do in CI CD? We're gonna run all of them. Because we don't care about how long it takes. And then we will catch those two. Yes, twice out of 40, uh, 400 times we will be very pissed off. It passed on our machine and it failed on CD. But you know what? We saved so much time that it's definitely worth it. Right? So this is predictive test selection. Again, something to think about and implement. Now, the other way of speeding up things. So we, we avoided everything we could. We cached everything we could. We test only what it should break. But what about what can be cached or avoided? We need to speed stuff up. There are a couple, again, of trivial ideas to implement today. For example, test parallelization. Use max power of your local machine, and this is why your boss should buy you the bleeding edge. Now, I don't know if you know, there is an Apple event with the new MacBooks Pros in, um, what, next week? October 30, right? Now, be ready, because next slide, I will give you one slide that will convince your boss to buy you the M3. Ready for it? Here we go. The, I have a project on my machine that runs for two minutes, the build. It's, most of it is test, like almost all of it is test, one, 159. I change one line of code and it goes to 10 seconds. From two minutes to 10 seconds, 12 times difference. You know what I do? Use all the available processors for testing. <coughs> now, you go to speaking at Jibaru, you download the slides, you take this slide, you take it to your boss the week after next. Hey boss, did you hear about the new M3s? This is why you need to buy it. And they will. Because this is really convincing. You cannot argue with numbers. Okay. Now you all have your new uh, laptops, or maybe you don't. How about we utilize even more processors? You know who has more processors? The cloud. The cloud has all the processors. <laughs> so we can, right? So we can run our tests, local tests, not CI, in the cloud. CI does it forever. It calls the fan out, it spins agents, it runs the test, great. But you should enjoy it for local tests. Your local build should be able to throw the tests out for the cloud and then just to collect results. You should use the cloud for distributing test load. And then you can run all the tests that needs to be run. No more, but definitely not less. Why not just use the CI infrastructure for it? You already have it set up. Because no one cares about how long the CI runs. So the CI infrastructure is usually not optimized for real-time feedback and the agents are not as fast as they can be because really, who cares? If it's synchronous feedback, you care about time, don't use CI agents. Instead, use something like test distribution feature 
to run this in the cloud. And the last part that I mentioned about everything is slow. Don't let it slide. Observe and improve. Measure local build times. The simplest thing, you just look how long your build takes and you take notice. You want to put it in Google Spreadsheets? Fine. You want to reduce toil and automate everything and throw a small, um, what it's called, Prometheus agent into it and record it and then show you a nice graph in Grafana? This is very geeky. Do that. <laughs> but observe and watch. Detect down from trends and then find root causes and improve it. Again, if you have something like the velocity, it's there out of the box. If you don't, I already told you how to do it for free. Don't pay for this shit to Gradle. We will be fine. Do it yourself. Shit is recorded. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll beep it out. So yeah, this is a trend that this is boiling the frog. You see how it climbs and, and then it's significantly slower. Did anyone notice? Not really if you didn't pay attention. So do pay attention. With that, let's talk more about tests. Eli. All right. Eh, not yet, not yet, we're not done. I, I'm coming back. All right, cool. Uh, Baruch told us a lot about build. He's also a very hard act to follow. I'm going to try it in any case. You're fine. All right, all right. I, I wear the t-shirt. I'm wearing the DPE t-shirt and his, his regard over here. Uh, next talks you do in test containers t-shirts. Uh, just give me one. <laughs> oh, okay. Cool, awesome. So uh, we talked a lot about build. We talked a lot about test distribution. We talked about lots of things. Let's talk about tests. Anyone here excited about tests? One? No, whoa, oh, there we go. Whoa, yeah, don't be shy. Uh, the idea is you all should say no, and then after Ellie, he asks it again, and you're like, oh. Okay, Come right, on, right, people. I'm going to try it. <laughs> all right, cool. Uh, so uh, tests, as we know them today, right? Trade-off. They're either expensive, slow, and production-like. Baruch talked a lot about CI testing. Or naive, useless, but fast, right? Mocks. All of us do mocks, right? They're fast. They give you fast feedback, except they're completely wrong. Right? The choices we have are wrong tests, or we do staging environments, or we do CIs, or we do and wait and get, uh, get a synchronous feedback that Baro has told us about. Is there another way? Right? I'm going to tell you a story. Baro told you about my resume. I'm going to use some of it. So I used to be on the S3 team over at, at, at AWS. Uh, and at the time, the AWS, the S3 team was fairly small, right? Uh, and we kind of, we ship S3, you know, we need to be able to know that the, the, the quality of what we're shipping is fairly high, right? Because something might happen and we might need release. And we had staging environment where we would deploy all of our staging, all, all of our integration tests. And we're like, okay, no one pays attention. What are we going to do? Like, okay, we used to sit in a room like this, similar to this, similar size. And the managers are like, yeah, you know what? Let's put monitors all over the room with the status of our integration tests. Right? Good idea? Eh, okay. All right, so they put the, te the, they put the, the, the monitors. No one pays, at pays attention. Why? Because it's there. How do they make us pay attention? Like, okay, great. Uh, uh, integration test with the main quality gate, they said, we're going to put a, a picture of a bunny, right? The picture of a bunny on those monitors, in addition to the status of our, of our tests, and the bunny would be happy-go-lucky, you know, excited. 80% of the tests are passing. Bunny is happy. Carry on, do your thing, right? Uh, 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 there we go. There we go. But you know, the bunny would be a little upset. And this was earlier times, a little bit less politically correct than today. The bunny would be bloody and massacred on the screen. And the idea was, hey, if, 80, if less than 80% of our tests are passing, everyone has to rush and save the bunny, right? We have to go and save the bunny because, because the bunny is not feeling very well. And one of the things that I realized as I stayed on the team for a little bit longer than the average stay at Amazon, which was eight months at a time, uh, <laughs> Uh, is that the bunny becomes much more depressed. It actually became clinically depressed over time, right? Because, because as, we, as the project matured, as we had more tests, as we had more things out there, there were more things that could go wrong with our integration tests and more things affected the bunny. So why the depressed bunny flakiness? 
data issues could cause the said bunny, deployment issues could, set, could cause the said bunny, an environment could be causing the said bunny, could be a bunch of different things. And as soon as you start seeing the said bunny for somewhat a significant amount of time, the don't care syndrome comes in. Anyone aware of the don't care syndrome except for Baruch? All right. So as soon as, like, as soon as your integration tests become flaky, as soon as they're like, oh, it's, it could be somebody else's problem, right? Somebody else broke the build. Somebody else it's broke. It's probably the, the environment. It's probably the environment, it's right? It's always the environment. It's always the environment, yeah. right? So like, so this this is the don't care syndrome, and it's a self fulfilling prophecy. Every single team I talk to you. Sooner or later, this comes down to this. The bunny becomes sad and depressed. And as a project matures, as a project gets more and more tests, as, a, as, as you have more and more core deploys, eventually the bunny, bunny gets depressed. And there are other so, there are solutions around, you know, you can do more environments, you can do, sooner or later, the bunny, the bunny will get depressed. So what do we want, right? To avoid the, the depressed bunny problem, we want you know, production-like feedback, and we want it locally, and we want it fast, All right? How do you do that? We believe that the answer is self-contained tests. Someone, some would call it hermetic tests, tests that are real tests, not just mocks, that actually, de that actually have real dependencies, that have, do not de depend on any centralized resources. Right? They're self-contained, they have everything they need in order to get running. Uh, there is no dependency between tests, That's way, that way you can run multiple of them at the same time. They're treated as code, same life cycle, right? so you don't have to spin anything el else up. And allow you to do clone and run. So you can just clone a repo, have the test, get it running, off you go. Right, but how? I'm gonna argue test containers is the answer. You know, somebody else has to pay, had to pay for me. There we go, I'm gonna talk about test containers. You pay uh, your own bill, liar. A what? You pay your own bill. Uh, there we go, there we go. All right, so I'm gonna do a quick demo. Uh, most people who were here, who answered the question that Baruch asked, uh, actually said, you all know test containers. Most know test containers? Anyone wants to see a demo? Should I skip the, oh, demo, all right, all right, demo, all right. Cool. <laughs> it will probably fail and it will be fun. It will be fun. There we go. This is All right, cool. Uh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to go into my IntelliJ. I'm going to going to do this. I'm going to just show you a quick class over here. Uh, this is an abstract class in Spring. S3 was written in Spring, by the way. Back in the day. What I'm doing over here is I'm defining uh, a Redis instance, a Kafka instance, a Postgres instance. This is all the setup that I'm doing, literally six lines of code, uh, telling where hosts are, setting the bootstrap servers for Kafka and the JDB, uh, and the, the connection strings. And then I'm able to do a real integration test, which is going to inherit from this abstract class, which is going to start the application, and is going to send requests against this application. And what I'm able to do over here is I'm able to just go and press run. And if, the, if demo gods are gonna be with me today, and they seem to be, what's happening over here is as my application is being stood up, I'm spinning up uh, Redis, I'm spinning up Kafka, I'm spinning up Postgres over here. Uh, it's going to start my application, it's going to run my code against those, if I'm lucky. And maybe it will also be green. Let's see. Hmm. Tempting to see. It's 50-50. 50-50. Either fast or fail. <laughs> Always 50-50. There we go. All right. There we go. It's green. So, awesome. There's a bit of delay. So, what happened over here? I, I stood up my application. I loaded data. I, I stood up all of its dependencies. And I was able to do a test, complete end-to-end -end test, integration test without depending on anything else right here from my local laptop. All of this, I lied, it's completely free. It's open source. You can do it today. Go to testcontainers.com. You're able to see it there. I'm going to go back to my presentation over here. There we go. Oh, 
there we go. All right, cool. All right, so uh, this is not just Ellie talking about this. This is actually used in a bunch of companies. So a bunch of companies do talk about using test containers. Uh, Spotify, last week, uh, they actually sent us $25,000 as a free open source uh, 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 donation to the test containers project. Uber talks about using test containers. They have like 30,000 tests as far as we know. Netflix talks about it just recently about using test containers. Spotify actually talked, to, uh, when they gave us the prize, they told us that they test every single one of their service with test containers. And you're able to use test containers with almost everything that's available as a Docker container. We have convenience methods for over 50 different technologies out there. So almost every single database that's out there, every single message broker, even uh, 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 cloud emulators. So there are emulate, local stack emulator for AWS, which AWS is not happy about, but that's beside the point. Uh, uh, Google has their cloud service emulators. Azure has their cloud service emulators. You're able to do it with almost every any technology that's out there. You can also spin up your own services as dependencies as some people do. This was nice, right? This was all free open source, great, awesome. But we can go more, we can go even deeper. All right, so Baruch talked about the pillars of GPE. That's the t-shirt I'm wearing today, right? So we talked about faster, uh, foster faster feedback, but we can go even further. All right, test observability and debugging. While I, t I showed you what you can do with test containers, uh, what we have done over here at Atomic Jar, the company that is paying for uh, me being here today, right? We, uh, we built test containers desktop, which is a battery included experience, which is an application that you can install on your machine, a free application for developers that allows you to freeze containers shut down. So test containers by default brings up, uh, uh, starts your application, brings up all the containers, and then when you're done, shuts them down for you. With test containers desktop, you can say, hey, do not shut those containers da down. I want to be able to go and debug and clean things. It allows you to do service configuration. So by default, test containers in the open source starts all of your services on random ports. This allows you to map them to known, well-known ports. It gives you a reuse of containers and as a small added bonus, we actually made it work without using local Docker. So we now have embedded runtime that we released two weeks ago, but who's counting? All right, I'm going to do a quick demo of, of what this actually does. All right, so I'm going to switch over to the same code that we were looking at. I'm going to set a breakpoint over here. Uh, this is a test container. Uh, we don't see him because you're on presentation. Ah, oh, smart. Thank you, Baruch. Oh, here we go. I was quietly, you know, there we go. So set the breakpoint. This is a test containers uh, desktop application. Please note the latest build running on my machine. It was baked today. All right, but bleeding edge. Bleeding edge. So what I'm gonna do like over here? Uh, like the bunny. There we go. All right, I'm gonna run this test in debug. Right. So it's going to do all of the magic that I showed you before. It's gonna spin up all of those dependencies, all of that stuff. And it's gonna hit the breakpoint in a second. Sweet. Maybe your boss will give you an M3. Huh? Uh, yeah, maybe my boss will get me an M3. I'm not sure. I can use the cloud in a second. All right, cool. So there we go. So what I have over here, I said freeze my container shut down. I have mapped uh, uh, Postgres. What I can do is I can do open terminal. And what it will do, it will open a window uh, that is a terminal to that particular container that I have running. And what I can do, I can do just... Uh, SQL. Oh, there we go. I can see what are the talks. I can do select star from talks. 
There we go. So what I was able to do is I was able to run a test containers based test. I was able to freeze container shutdown so I can now log into that particular container. I can now log into that container and see what's inside of it as I'm debugging my software over here. All of it is running locally on my local machine. All of it is uh, available if you use test containers desktop, which is free and is available at testcontainers.com. There we go. Right, but we can go even further, right? That is, uh, we talked a little bit about what you can do with your local development environment. We talked a little bit about what you can, how you can go and dig deeper into test containers based code. Uh, we've built test containers cloud which is a cloud backend for your test containers. So as opposed to spinning up your test containers locally, you can now spin them up and run them up in the cloud. And that gives you, you know, consistency, whether you're running on a, a, a Windows or Apple Silicon, as Baruch has suggested, uh, M3 is coming out. So many of you will be running M3. So if you want a consistent experience between various team members on your team, uh, that gives you that. Docker and Docker issues with test containers. Anyone run into them? Yeah. There we go. A few of you. So if you if you run into Docker and Docker situations in your CI, you can hook up test containers cloud and spin up those containers up in the cloud. So no more Docker and Docker situations. Turbo mode. So when you're running your test containers based tests, we can give you many more machines than just than just your local machine. Uh, and then team and enterprise visibility into what you're doing, you get this beautiful dashboard that gets you more insight into each individual test run that you're doing. You can see visibility into what containers are being used on your team. So if you guys, if someone is testing this Cassandra tree and the organization is trying to move from Cassandra tree to Cassandra four, you can see who's testing with what, and you can see a lot more visibility into, into your whole teams and enterprise usage. It connects to our backend through encrypted tunnels, and you can't really see the slide. Awesome, we have over 30, lo 30 edge locations to make sure that you have uh, locality and that you can have low latency when uh, you are using Test Containers Cloud. With that, I hope I have helped you, to, I, I have helped convince you that Test Containers is DPE uh, and have helps with developer productivity with that, Baro? Yep, let's, uh, let's wrap it up. So yeah, um, the only thing to mention is that um, the gains are real, not only but what you feel right now, and I hope you feel right now like, yeah, we, we need to do it. Um, I mentioned that a lot of companies already do that. And, and they report back, and they report really incredible numbers, 84% of people who of organizations who embarked on this process of developer productivity engineering actually report that it dramatically improves productivity. My favorite slide is this. The same, probably 84%, probably the same people, reported that developer productivity engineering fosters developer joy. I love it because it brings memories from my childhood. And I hope it will bring yours as well. Recall first time you start programming. You wrote code for first time. I bet it was joy. Because you created something out of nothing. Remember that? And then WebSphere, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Let's bring it back. Let's bring back the joy. The way to bring back the joy, for, for, for me at least, is developer productivity engineering. You are productive, you create something, you are not frustrated, this is joy. So with that, speaking.jbaruch or this QR code is the same URL. You can take Gradle and Maven speed channel over there, uh, speed challenge over there. It's just speed up your own build. If you are afraid to run it on your own build, we have ideas of open source project that you can play with. Uh, DP agent of change. You are all like, hey, let's do DP, you come tomorrow morning, okay, what do I do? We have a lot of resources to help you to convince your organization and we'll win prizes while doing that. They, they are all arranged as challenges that you do and win prizes, pretty cool. DPE handbook is there if you want to learn more about DPE and the DPE summit videos 
They talk a lot about DPE in general, test containers in particular, Spotify talk is there talking about test containers, uh, Netflix talk there talking about test containers, a lot of good stuff as well. Also there, test containers uh, URL when you can download test containers for desktop and uh, the URL to join test container Slack if you have any questions or want to participate there. I think Gradle Community Slack is there as well. A lot of resources at speaking.jbaro. With that, Thank you very much. We actually have 10 minutes for questions, surprisingly. Um, I'm J Baruch at J Baruch. This is Eli at Eliner. And uh, this is Toronto Jack. And this is the hashtag that we just hijacked. So don't forget to use it when you praise this talk on, on uh, social. Speaking.jbaruch, the slides are there, the video is going to be there, all the links. Thank you very much.